morning, everyone. Oh, such an attentive group and enlightening family. Just want to welcome you to Jarvisburg. We realize that there are so many places you could come worship, and we're just so, so thankful that we have such a great church family. And having said that, I, I got a card here that I want to read. Um, this is from uh, Miss Jeanette Chapel, who recently lost her husband, Sam, suddenly from a heart attack. And um, my heart goes out to her, and uh, I just thank you, each and every one of you that went there and just supported her. But her card says, thank you. Words cannot express my gratitude to my JCC family. Thank you for all the love, support, and food you furnished for Sam's funeral. I love you guys in JCC. Thanks. Jeanette, Sandra, and Andrea. P.S. G.S. and Little Bitty even got a little Cajun bite. That's her two dogs. So thank you, Miss Jeanette, and just so sorry for your loss. And let me just uh, say this also. There's a there's a prayer insert inside your bulletin each Sunday. And there's so many people on there that we can pray for. And those prayers are felt by the people. So continue to pray. Now, let's turn our heart to the Lord and stand and worship. And if I got us with us, then 
world you step down into darkness open my eyes let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you a hope of a life spent with you so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me king of all days and so highly exalted glorious in so humbly you came to the earth you created all for love's sake became poor so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me so here I am to worship here I am Someone that I admire quite a bit from history, and you might have heard me mention him before, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor and theologian during the time of the Nazis in Germany. He resisted them both politically and spiritually, and he would eventually be arrested for being involved in a conspiracy against Hitler. During his imprisonment, which was very rough, Bonhoeffer was cut off from other believers and it took a heavy toll on him. He would express through writings and uh, other conversations that being cut off from the nurturing fellowship of other Christians, he felt a deeper hunger for the fellowship that was no longer available to him. Like a hungry man who knows the taste of bread, though he can no longer reach and break from the loaf. He knew that the power of fellowship, and he also knew how painful it was when it's absent. I think this is true of all of us. We really don't know how much we need fellowship, Christian fellowship, until it's denied to us. Only then would some of us realize and understand the blessings that it is to be a part 
and among the body of Christ. In Acts chapter 2, these blessings are spelled out on the day of Pentecost. It said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let us always take advantage of meeting together. Because some do not have this blessing every week. I don't think we've had any major interruptions other than a hurricane or bad weather. Aside from that, we've had no interruptions in meeting together. But there are some in the kingdom of God around the world who don't have this luxury. But like Bonhoeffer, it can easily be taken away. And then we would suffer and understand That God saves us, but all of our support and our nurturing comes from the bond of the Spirit that we have with one another. So when we take the bread and juice this morning that represents Jesus' body and blood, I want you to remember Christ crucified and resurrected, but also remember our unity. Our unity first with Christ, and after that, our unity with each other. Because when we partake of these emblems, We are confessing to one another our belief in the death and resurrection of Christ. And we are confessing to one another that we are brothers and sisters in that body of Christ. Remember these things as we partake of the emblems this morning. Please hold them as the men distribute them as we will take them together in unison at the reading of God's word. that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one that set me
Praise the one that set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning. That sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning that sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Jesus, yours is the Praise the one that set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the
for I received from the Lord, but I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance. This year, Jarvisburg has seen nine memorial services. Most of them were held here. A few of them were held somewhere close in the community. But one thing was the same in all of those services, no matter who they were for or where they were held. At those services, we prayed together. At those services, we read scripture together. We ate meals together. We shared fond stories of our loved ones and friends together. And we provided a shoulder to lean on together. That's what we call community. That's what we call family. And it's also what we call fellowship. And as we continue in our series today, that is our focus, fellowship. It's more than just eating together and shooting the breeze, although that's also a great way to fellowship, and quite frankly, that may, might be the most common for us. But it's more than that. It's about reinforcing our common bond together that is stronger than any other bond or any other blood connection that we have on this earth. Our bond is the common faith in Jesus Christ and the supporting and indwelling Holy Spirit that tethers us together. That is our common 
bond. And as I mentioned earlier, when we partook of the Lord's Supper, that is what we were confessing and recognizing was our common bond, our common faith, and our shared experience with the Holy Spirit. 1 John chapter 1, verses 3-7 through 7 tells us this. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us all from sin. We have a common goal to glorify Jesus Christ. We have a common lifestyle that is to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. And we have a common destiny. We're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Yet so many of us allow so many things things to keep us from fellowshipping on a regular basis. For some, it's the fear that we won't fit in. For others, it could be that you have a strong anxiety of socializing. And even still others, you just might place church fellowship at a very low priority compared to other things. But I want to tell you today that our fellowship, our bond, together through Christ. It's greater than any of these problems and it's greater than any of the misunderstandings or excuses that we have. Our fellowship is greater than that and we need it. And I'll begin by telling you this, that our fellowship is greater than our diversity. Our fellowship is greater than our diversity. When we think of the New Testament, we're talking about diversity. Let's go back and think about the 12 apostles, right? A motley crew, so to speak, of guys gathered together, called by Jesus to follow him, disciple him, and to learn his teachings and obey him. The 12 apostles were no doubt a diverse group. You had tradesmen of all different types, fishermen, tax collectors, uh, people who had strong political and radical ideas. This was a diverse group of men if I've ever seen them. And it's a test of testimony to the fact that Jesus will call on whom he ever calls upon to serve him. And that group group proved it. But let me give you a a more specific example. On one hand, you had Matthew, the tax collector. Okay, in our eyes, he's a government worker. He's Mr. IRS. And some of you already get negative connotations about Mr. IRS. Matthew's Mr. Big Government, okay? And then on the other end, someone we really don't hear much about in the Bible, you have Simon the Zealot. Sometimes he's referred to as Simon a something else or whatever. He's got so many names. But the one that would define him most appropriately is Simon the Zealot. A zealot in those days was a group of Jewish individuals who wanted to see a revolution and a military overthrow of Rome and with it all their taxes and laws. So you have Mr. Big Government. Mr. Revolution. That's like President Trump and Nancy Pelosi holding hands in the park, singing together, eating ice cream. Do you see what I'm getting at? These men couldn't be any different in terms of their profession, and they couldn't be any different in terms of their political ideals. Matthew was fine working hand-in-hand with both local and Roman governments, but then Simon, he's living the life of saying, no, we need to get rid of these Romans and have our own laws and get rid of these extra taxes that are a burden. You see what's happening here? If they can get along, can't Republicans and Independents and Democrats get along in a church building? I would hope so. What was their common bond? What happened? They were called upon Jesus to walk and to believe and to serve him. He pulled together these guys for one cause. That is the kingdom of heaven. Now that mirrors the church today. We all have different looks. We look different. Some of us look funnier than others. We have different means of wealth. 
We have different hobbies. We have different habits. We have different entertainment preferences, style preferences. We have different political philosophies. We have different pet peeves, right? We're very different. We're very diverse in many different ways. Now, none of this is new to you. You know this. Yet, like the apostles, we are unified and united by something greater than our egos and our personalities and our habits. That is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He is our unifier, and the Spirit tethers us together. That's what the Lord's Supper is telling us every time we take it. I can't emphasize this enough. When you take the Lord's Supper, you are recognizing and revering what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, and you're recognizing that he also rose again, and because of his death and resurrection, we will have eternal life. But it's also another thing. It is a reminder that we are family, that we are connected. And that's why Paul in Corinthians, when he was correcting the Corinthian church on how bad and disorderly and how disrespectful they were around the Lord's Supper, one of the things he emphasized was the fact that they needed to examine themselves and to see where they were with God and where they were with their brothers and sisters. And it's plain and simple. If there is something between you and a fellow Christian and you have not resolved it, you need to examine yourself. And I think you need to hold back, as Paul would say. Go fix what's going on with your brother and sister. Seek forgiveness. Accept forgiveness. Pray for peace. And then come back and recognize that we are one body. Because we need that. Diversity is something that Christ celebrates because he made us different. And it's even more glorified the fact that the church of Jesus Christ, the New Testament, is about everyone who comes to faith in Christ. The Jewish people were selected for a service. They fulfilled that service. In those days, though, it was monolithic. You were either a part of Israel or you weren't. But now, salvation is offered to all. No matter your color, your race, your language, your age, gender, whatever. That's awesome. I'm so grateful for the Old Testament and where Israel had in their place. But now we have evolved into a place where Christ is calling upon all nations to follow. And if you think that you're too different to fellowship, you're not. Because through Christ we are all one. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul makes this clear. There's no more spiritual difference between a man or a woman, or slave and a master, or Greek or Jew. Same thing today. It doesn't matter what you look like when you walk in that door. I don't care what your fashion sense is, what color your skin is. It doesn't matter. Because we're called upon to preach the gospel to all creatures. And if they're already a Christian walking in, we're called to love them and embrace them in fellowship. Diversity should never be something to hinder you. You have quirky ways about you? Well, we all do. You've got pet peeves? Well, we all do. There's a lot of people right now criticizing me. I, I, I'm rubbing them the wrong way. The way I speak, the way I look. That's fine. We're all different. We all have differences, but none of that should ever deter us from embracing and putting emphasis on our fellowship with one another because we are stronger through our diversity. And that's what makes us great. Our fellowship is greater than any any worries we have about fitting in. It is greater than our diversity. It makes us stronger because of our diversity. Another thing is that our fellowship is greater than our anxieties. And I know anxieties are a problem, aren't they? Stress is statistically at an all-time high, I guess, if you were to look at statistics and talk to doctors and psychologists. Right now, I'll confess something to you. And I've told a few people this privately, but I'll tell the whole church this and everyone on Facebook who might be watching. I am an introvert. Who knows what an introvert is? Okay, a good number, more than I was, I was fearing. What an introvert is, is someone who prefers to be alone. It's someone who prefers to be at home with a blanket watching TV. Don't bother me. I'm chilling. An introvert is someone who does not feel comfortable in huge crowds. They, they usually get find a corner or a crack 
and just hide in with their drink or cake while everyone else is mingling. That's an introvert. The opposite of that is an extrovert, and you can understand what that is. That's someone who is just ready to jump in that social pile and get to know people and to hug them and to talk to them. You know, those kind of people that just come up and hug you, you don't know them from Adam, right? Like this Mary Kent, but I love her hugs. She gave me a hug before I knew her. Thank you. But introverts and extroverts, it's a psychological definition, but you know what? That's, that's how human beings are. Some of us are more prone to smaller settings, more private settings. Some of us are more into the big groups and the partying. Many people simply have difficulty socializing in large settings, and it gives people anxieties. It's understandable. But we cannot allow us to deprive ourselves of the need and the benefits of fellowship. So here's what I'm saying. Praying and meditation on God's Word alone is great and necessary. It's great to have your private time with God, and it's necessary to pray without ceasing, to study the Word. But you cannot experience the love and support of the body of Christ if you are not with the body of Christ. We as a church must always make people feel comfortable when they come to worship with us, okay? While encouraging the importance of fellowship. So I'm saying now, you cannot ignore the body of Christ. You need to be extroverted in a way. But let's remember that we need to gradually bring people in if they have those anxieties. Because people have those kind of things. Uh, like I said, myself. I, I told you this before, 15, 20 years ago, I'd laugh at you if I told you I'd be preaching almost 200 people a Sunday. I'd laugh at your face. Maybe insult you a little bit and walk away. But where God has brought me today, I've been able to overcome that. Not because I'm no longer an introvert. I still like being on my couch at home watching football or a show. Okay? No offense, guys. But you know what? I'm called to something higher. I'm called to be with my family whenever possible. And that's what we have to overcome. What we gain from worshiping and fellowshipping together far outweighs any fears or anxieties of social life. And this part might not speak to most of you that I'm getting at, but you'd be surprised there are hundreds or thousands of people who don't come to church because they're so scared of something. They're scared of socializing. They're scared of crowds. They're scared of people getting in their business. Well, no. We want to bring you to Christ because he knows your business, and we want to help you make a connection there and to make a connection with each other. Thank you. So I'll say to you now, if you have this problem here and you're out there listening, if you have anxieties about being with us, other than Mary Kent hugging you to death at the door, we're not going to smother you. We're going to love you and welcome you. And when you're ready, you become part of this family through Christ. So our fellowship is greater than our anxieties if we have them. But here's another thing that really needs to be heard by everyone because this might be the worst problem of them all. Our fellowship is greater than all other bonds. Now, what do I mean by that? There is something that must be understood very clearly. All right? This may upset some people, but it's the truth. You cannot follow Christ and forsake the church. Do you understand what I'm saying? You cannot have Jesus Christ and say, I don't want anything to do with the church. And you might think that I'm making this up and it's baloney, but no. There are people who actually go out and try to promote such a thing. And I'm not trying to throw judgment on other Christians or other churches in different places. But no, when you come to Christ, when you accept Christ, you are also accepting the family of God, the community of God, the body of Christ. You are accepting God's people. Because church has become a dirty word to a lot of Christians. For some Christians, they've had bad experiences growing up in certain churches. And I understand that that ha carries a lot of baggage. But we can't shy away from the truth that we need the church, a.k.a. we need each other. Christ will take us to where he wants us to be. He will empower us. He will save us. He will sanctify us. But he also meant for the church to be our source of encouragement, our source of recharging. Remember when I talked about us being batteries? We've got to recharge. A battery lying on the ground isn't going to recharge. It's got to be put into a charger, right? 
That's how we get our energy back. That's how we get our confidence back. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear we are not to make the habit of not attending a habit. He makes it clear that we're not supposed to forsake coming together. As I read Acts during our communion meditation, that was the culmination of a fantastic event that the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles and that the gospel was preached for the first time and thousands believed and were baptized. And then following that, they became immediately became a new community of faith that loved each other, that supported each other, that broke bread with one another, that gave to one another. It was immediate because of their joy that they found salvation through Christ and that they are now sharing the Holy Spirit. They were one body. So what business do we have saying, I don't need that? You don't. One of the worst things that us preachers can hear is someone saying that I can get just as much from God in my fishing boat or sitting on my couch as I can come into church. No, you can't. And that might hurt some of your feelings. I don't know. But you cannot get the same experience being here with the body of Christ by just rejecting that and being by yourself and fulfilling your own satisfaction of your hobbies and whatnot. Yes, you can have one-on-ones with God. Yes, it's great to meditate on His Word and to pray and to have alone time with God. That's required, that's appropriate, that's encouraged, but don't ever think that means you can disconnect from your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because when you surrender your life to Jesus and you are baptized, you made a commitment commitment, first to God, and then second to the body of Christ. You have been added to the church. Remember that last line in Acts 2? God was adding daily to their numbers those who were saved. When you come to Christ by faith and you are baptized, you are added to the roles. Technically, we don't join anything. God is the one in control. He is putting you on his list, that good old book of life. You've been added. You're part of a family. You're part of someone that you're supposed to be a part. And community matters. And you know this. In your own neighborhoods, they matter. In in your fraternities at school, they matter. In your family reunions, they matter. Well, just think of all that on a far greater scale here at church. It's more than just checking off your routines and checking off your obligations to God. This is also for you. This is for you to worship God and to be recharged and energized so that you can go out and serve Christ. Last week, we celebrated God's blessings for 126 years. And boy, did we celebrate, right? Great food together, great conversations together, laughter all around, fun activities. The kids loved that slide. I tell you, they were going for four or five hours, right? Right? guys that kept checking on them or watching them. I loved water parks too, but I, I didn't have that energy as a kid. They loved it. We were together because Jesus brought us together through his redeeming power. Amen? We have a common goal to glorify Jesus Christ. We have a common lifestyle to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. And we have a common destiny, spending eternity with Jesus Christ. Now this bond, this fellowship, it's greater than anything that can keep us apart. And with that Holy Spirit tethering us together, you know nothing can break us apart. There's no knife, there's no saw, there's nothing that can cut that string that holds us together. Because it's God holding us together. And nothing's going to overpower God. A godly church and a healthy church are ones that fellowship together. Now, You might wonder, why such a sermon on fellowship after we just had a great day of fellowship last week? I'll tell you, because we're sinful and we have bad habits and we start to forget. Anniversary Sunday is not the only opportunity we have to be together like this every Sunday. Every opportunity we have to fellowship 
Let's take advantage of it. Let's hold on to it and cherish it. Because this is one of the reasons that we've been saved. To serve God, to serve one another, to love one another. Let's continue to fellowship together. Today, we come to our time of invitation. If you do not have fellowship with the Father, if you do not have a relationship with God, that can be changed. Through faith in Jesus Christ, repenting of your past sins, confessing Him as your Lord and Savior, and being baptized, today you can reestablish that bond and that fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. If that's your need today, if your need is to, by faith, come back to the family of God, we invite you to do so. If you have any questions or desire to come forward and to publicly rededicate yourself, we invite you to do so as well. Or anything in terms of prayers or membership uh, questions, don't hesitate as we stand up and we sing our song of invitation. cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow. for just a moment. I have several announcements, although I want to bring your attention to the bulletin that uh, I won't be mentioning everything, so always grab a bulletin because uh, that's where we're going to have a lot of our news and updates on things, so make sure you grab a bulletin and keep up with everything just in case it's not announced verbally so you can be up to date. I just want to pass on some news uh, for those who have been asking about Ms. Helen. Ms. Helen is now going to continue her recovery from surgery at Chesapeake Health and Rehab Center up in Chesapeake. And the address is in the bulletin if you'd like to have it. So if you want to call or visit her, uh, that's where she'll be staying for the immediate future as she continues to heal from her back surgery, which went well, by the way, for those who have not heard. I want to also uh, emphasize something that's not in the bulletin. That is choir for our special events is about to start back up again. And the choir will start their uh, rehearsals uh, September 5th at 7 p.m. Do I have that right? I think so, yeah. So the, the sign-up sheet is still over here, and I've been asked to just make sure I emphasize this today, that if you have any interest in being part of the choir, even if you just want to ask some questions, sign up, and Mike, who leads our special music and choir, he will get with you and talk to you about what's going to go on, okay? This is coming up for our holidays 
coming up soon. So we need some people to uh, come in and give us their best voice. It won't be me, but we need people to fill up our choir. So please be sure to keep that in mind. And also, uh, the, the, the food pantry is still collecting water, uh, bottled orange juice, and canned uh, meat or canned chicken. So please continue to bring that in for us if you can. That will be going on to the end of September. And when we pray today, I'm going to emphasize something. Uh, school is starting. <laughs> for Kerr, Tuck, and Dare, that starts tomorrow. Okay. All right. I know some people are real anxious. And for Jarvisburg Christian Academy, that starts on the 28th. So depending on your age, you're either extremely excited or extremely depressed. So let's pray for our students to have a great year, and for our teachers and administrators to have a great year, that these students can learn and uh, have a great school year. Okay, let's make sure we're praying for them, for the teachers and the kids. That's that. So before we close, Ms. Dawn has come up and she has asked for continued prayer because her, sur her knee surgery is this Friday. All right, it's going to be up in Sentara Lee. We don't have the time yet, but it'll be up in Sentara Lee. Uh, so she's asking for prayers and she'll be having knee replacement and uh, she's going to have time for healing after that. But we're going to keep Dawn in our prayers. And what I would like to do, and we're going to try to make this more of a habit, we're going to pray for Dawn by coming and gathering around her and praying. So. I want to ask you to stand, try to come close, and let's connect and put our hands on Dawn so we can pray over her and pray for the dismissal of our service. Let's stand and gather. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again so much for all your blessings. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day of worship and praise and fellowship. And Lord, we just pray that we will take uh, the scriptures to heart and understand that our fellowship with one another is important and it's vital to our life in Christ. We just pray that we uh, follow through with being with one another and supporting one another whenever possible. Lord, we also want to pray for school that is starting, Lord. We know that it, it, some years can be tough for students and teachers, but we just pray that the teachers and the students will have a safe and productive year and that they will uh, come out with great educations. We just pray your, your hand will be with the schools and the teachers and students. Lord, we thank you for Miss Helen and her recovery, and we just pray that she continues to recover. And Lord, we continue to pray for all those who are sick and afflicted today and who need your prayer, and we just pray your healing hand will be on them. And specifically, Lord, we pray for Dawn, who's about to have knee surgery, Lord, that it is important for her for quality of life. And Lord, we just pray that you will guide the doctors and the surgeons and nurses to make sure that the surgery grows, goes well and that her recovery will be well. Lord, let's remember to love her, to support her, and to help her wherever she needs help. We trust in you, Lord, and we just pray that the next time Dawn is able to walk in here on her own power, she will have knees that give her no more pain. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings again, and we pray that you be with all those who need prayer that we may not know or mention. We thank you for your blessings and your power. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Don't have to go home, but you can't see your next <laughs>
darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. Fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. The chase no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance When I'm staying in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love of my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love of my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in. Your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance.